Chapter 14 of The Americans is entitled The Great Depression Begins. The year is 1929. The U.S. economy has completely collapsed. Farms, businesses, and banks nationwide have failed, causing massive unemployment and crushing poverty. Americans are out of work with little prospect of finding a job. On this first slide, we'll see some photographs by the famous American photographer of the 1930s, Dorothea Lange, who was paid by the federal government to travel through the country photographing the hardships people were struggling with as they came to deal with what is known as the Great Depression. In this chapter, we'll answer questions such as, what would you have done to feed your family during the Great Depression? Also, we'll need to find out which groups of people were most impacted by the economic crash. Next, what could Americans have done during this time to find a job? And what could impoverished Americans have done to help each other through these hard times? Chapter 14, Section 1 is entitled The Nation's Sick Economy. The main idea of this section is that as prosperity of the 1920s ended, a severe economic problem gripped the nation. In this section, we'll see how important industries struggled in the 1920s. A superficial prosperity in the late 20s shrouded weaknesses that would signal the onset of the Great Depression. Key industries such as railroads, textiles, and steel had barely made a profit, while railroads lost business to new forms of transportation like trucks, buses, and private automobiles. Mining and lumbering, which had expanded during the war, were no longer in high demand. Coal mining was especially hard hit, in part due to stiff competition from new forms of energy, including hydroelectric power, fuel, oil, and natural gas. By the 1930s, these sources supplied more than half the energy that had once come from coal. Even these boom industries of the 1920s, automobiles, construction, consumer goods, were now weak. One important economic indicator that declined during this time was housing starts. That's a term that defines the number of new houses being built. And when housing starts fell, so did jobs in many related industries, such as furniture, manufacturing, and lumber. Farmers needed a lift. Perhaps no agriculture suffered the most of all. During World War I, prices rose and international demand for crops, such as wheat and corn, soared. Farmers had planted more and taken out loans for land and equipment. However, demand fell after the war and crop prices declined by 40% or more. Farmers boosted their production in the hopes of selling more crops, but this only depressed prices further. Between 1919 and 1921, annual farm income declined from $10 billion a year to just over $4 billion a year. Farmers who had gone into debt had difficulty paying off their loans. Many lost their farms as banks foreclosed and seized property as the payment for the debt. As farmers began to default on their loans, many rural banks also began to fail. Auctions were held to recoup or regain some of the bank's losses. Congress tried to help out farmers with a piece of legislation called the McNary-Houghton Bill. This bill called for federal price supports for key products such as wheat, corn, cotton, and tobacco. This essentially means that the government would buy the surplus crops at a guaranteed price and then sell them on the world market. The President of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, vetoed the McNary-Houghton bill twice, saying, farmers have never made money. I don't believe we can do much about it. <laughs> 
Consumer spending spiraled downward in the late 1920s. As farmers' income fell, they, like many, bought fewer goods and services. But the problem was even larger than that. By the late 1920s, Americans were buying less, mainly because of rising prices, stagnant or unchanging wages, and an unbalanced distribution of income. The buying on credit in the preceding years had also led to difficulty for many Americans who had an overwhelming amount of debt. Production of goods had also expanded much faster than the wages that people earned, resulting in an ever-widening gap between the rich and the poor. Although many Americans appeared to be prosperous in the 1920s, in fact, they were living beyond their means. They often bought goods on credit, an arrangement in which consumers agreed to buy now and pay later for purchases. The making, by making credit easily available, businesses encouraged Americans to pile up consumer debt. While the wealthiest Americans saw their incomes rise 75% in the 1920s, the rest of the population saw an increase of only 9% and more than 70% of American families earned less than $2,500 a year. Herbert Hoover wins the 1928 presidential election against Democratic candidate Alfred E. Smith. Hoover was the Secretary of Commerce under Presidents Harding and Coolidge. He was a mining engineer from Iowa who had run, never run for public office before. Alfred E. Smith was a career politician who had served four terms as governor of New York, but Hoover had one major advantage. He could point to the years of prosperity under Republican administrations since 1920, saying, we in America are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before. Hoover won an overwhelming victory. This map shows the election of 1928. The blue states all voted for Herbert Hoover, including California. Alfred Smith didn't even win his home state of New York. Popular only in the Democratic South, still angry at Republicans who freed the slaves in the, in the Civil War. He also won Rhode Island and Massachusetts. This is a photograph showing a young Hoover supporter in 1928. His support would soon quickly evaporate. The financial collapse of the stock market in 1929 signals the beginning of the Great Depression. In early 1929, stock prices peaked and then fell. Confidence in the market started to waver and some investors quickly sold their stocks and pulled out. On November 24th, the stock market took a plunge, and panicked investors unloaded their shares. The stock market had become the most visible symbol of prosperous American economy. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was a barometer of the stock market's worth. The Dow Jones is measured based on the price of 30 large firms even though thousands of companies are bought and sold on the stock market every day. As stock prices rose throughout the 20s, the Dow Jones Industrial Average reached a high in 1929 of 381 points. That's 300 points higher than it was just five years earlier in 1924. By 1929, four million Americans owned stock. The seeds of trouble began when the stock market crashed. It crashed because of speculation and buying on margin. Speculation is the belief that if someone buys a stock or a bond, it'll go up quickly and they can sell it in the hopes of making a quick profit. The system of buying stocks on margin involves paying a small percentage of a stock's price as a down payment and then borrowing the rest from your stock broker. With easy money available to investors, unrestrained buying and selling fueled the stock market's upward growth. The government did very little to discourage buying or, try, or even tried to regulate the market. 
the rising prices did not actually reflect the company's worth. Worse yet, the value of the stocks declined and people who bought on margin had no way of paying back. The financial collapse begins in 1929 on Black Tuesday. The stock market had an unusual up and down movement just prior to this. And on October 24th, uh, the stock market began to plunge. It took its deepest plunge on October 29th, now known as Black Tuesday. On that day, 16.4 million shares were sold and the prices kept falling. People who had bought on margin or credit were stuck with huge debts. Frederick Lewis Allen, in your textbook on page 469, recalls this day, saying, the big bull market was dead. Billions of dollars worth of profits and paper profits had disappeared. The grocer, the window cleaner, and the seamstress had lost their savings. In every town there were families which had suddenly dropped from showy affluence into debt. With the big bull market gone and prosperity going, Americans were soon to find themselves living in an altered world which called for new adjustments, new ideas, new habits of thought, and a new order of values. That new order of values will be the questioning of the role of capitalism in the American economy. Once again, we see the boom and bust cycle of capitalism wreaking chaos on average Americans' lives. This chart shows the upward and downward movement of the Dow Jones Industrial Average in the 1929 crash, showing the value soaring to above $360 for one share of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, crashing in one day by more than 200 points, ultimately ending up less than $100. This poster shows different views of Wall Street, investors reading ticker tape in the excitement before the bubble bursts, and then ultimately at the bottom right-hand corner with the year 1929 spelled out in a rope by which investors hung themselves. Notice at the bottom left in the blue box, we will see some of the more important and wealthy individuals in the United States and how much they lost just on that day alone. And to convert these dollars to current dollars, multiply the figures by 10. And you'll see that, for example, JP Morgan lost over $600 million in one day. Thus begins the Great Depression, which is section two. The Depression devastates everyone in their daily lives. Cities across the country see people who had lost their jobs, who were evicted from their homes, and ended up in the streets. The Great Depression is generally defined as the period from 1929 through 1940 during which the economy plummeted and unemployment skyrocketed. The crash alone did not cause the depression, but the stock market crash brought about its arrival. The Great Depression was caused by many things, including the credit, the overproduction, and ultimately the role of the banks and the government in their encouragement of people to speculate and overconsume. After the crash, Many Americans panicked and withdrew their money from the banks. The banks had invested in the stock market as well, and they lost all their money. When it, the savers wanted their money back and the banks didn't have it, the banks failed. And in 1929 alone, over 600 banks failed. Four years later, by the end of 1933, 11,000 of the 25,000 banks nationwide had collapsed, shrinking the size of the American economy by 25%. Gross national product drops and unemployment soars. Gross national product is the total output of a nation 
in terms of its goods and services. And between 1928 and 1932, the gross national product of the United States, the GNP, fell nearly 50% from $104 billion in, the, in one year to just $59 billion in one year. During that time, 90,000 businesses went bankrupt and unemployment rose from 3% in 1929 to 25% in 1933. You can see the chart on this slide how in 1929 unemployment leaps up to above 25%, only to come down during the World War II years when the federal government took total control over the economy and the New Deal employed people when private businesses could not. The U.S. was not alone in its suffering during the Great Depression. Much of Europe suffered as well throughout the 1920s. And in 1930, the United States Congress passed the toughest tariffs in U.S. history called the Holly smoot Tariff. As you know, a tariff is a tax on imported goods. And this tax was meant to protect U.S. industries. However, it had the opposite effect. Just at the moment, at the moment, U.S. Gov, U.S. At the moment that U.S. businesses needed international trade the most, the United States government made it more difficult for the United States to do trade around the world. In reaction to the Holly Smoot tariff, other countries enacted their own tariffs on imports, and overall world trade fell by 40%. Now, the causes of the Great Depression include the tariffs of the Holly Smoot law, as well as war debt policies that kept European countries suffering. The United States had low demand for its products, even though factories were producing more and more and more. The farms suffered because they overproduced crops when demand was very low. Consumers had a lot of access to easy credit and investors had access to easy credit and used this to speculate on stocks and to buy things they couldn't pay for, houses, cars, washing machines. But one of the biggest causes of the Great Depression was the unequal distribution of income, in which the wealthy 1% of the country controlled 70% of all of the goods and services, and most Americans had nothing. Chapter 14, Section 2, described the hardships during the Great Depression. The Great Depression brought homelessness and hunger to millions of Americans. Across the country, people lost their jobs and their homes. Others built makeshift shacks out of scrap materials called shanty towns, little towns that sprang up all across the country. An observer recalled one of these shanty towns in Oklahoma City, saying, here were all these people living in old, rusted out car bodies. These were people living in shacks made of orange crates. One family with a whole lot of kids were living in a piano box. People were living in whatever they could junk together. One of the most common features in urban areas during this time were soup kitchens and bread lines. They were lines where people waited to receive food provided by charitable organizations or sometimes even public agencies. One man described it in your book on page 473, saying two or three blocks along Times Square You'd see these men silent, shuffling along in a line, getting this handout of coffee and donuts dealt out from great trucks. I'd see that flat, 
opaque, expressionless look which spelled for me human disaster. Men who had responsible positions, who had lost their jobs, lost their homes, lost their families. They were destroyed men. For African Americans, it was even worse. Hard times had already been a fact of life for many African Americans. One quote from your book says, The Negro was born in depression. It didn't mean too much to him, the great American depression. The best he could be is a janitor or a porter or a shoeshine boy. It only became official when it hit the white man. Unemployment across the country stood at 25%, but the unemployment rate among African Americans was over 50%. During this time, other racial minorities experienced even more difficulty. Racial violence began to soar as whites took out their aggression against African Americans. Latinos, mainly Mexicans and Mexican Americans, were also targets. Whites demanded that they be deported or expelled from the country, even though many had been born in America and were American citizens. Hundreds of thousands of people of Mexican descent voluntarily left, and others were actually deported by their own government. Conditions for African Americans, as we said, were very difficult. Increasing violence alone accounted for 24 lynchings in the year 1933. Rural life in the Great Depression. While the Great Depression was difficult for everyone, farmers did have one advantage. They could grow food for their families. Thousands of farmers, however, lost their land. Many turned to tenant farming and barely scraped out an existence. Then, in the early 1930s, the farmers experienced the nation's greatest environmental disaster ever. A severe drought gripped the Great Plains. The overproduction farmers had engaged in in order to make money during the Great Depression created loose, unfertile topsoil. The winds scattered the topsoil, exposing sand and grit the resulting dust traveled hundreds of miles. In the region that was hardest hit, including Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, and Colorado, this area became known as the Dust Bowl. Thousands of farmers, plagued by dust storms and evictions, left their land and moved west, following Route 66 all the way to California. These migrants were known as Okies, a term that originally referred to people from Oklahoma, but came to be used negatively for all migrants. They came to California to work as farmhands in the fruit orchards. Thousands continued to wander and search for work. One storm, for example, in 1934, even carried millions of tons of dust from the plains all the way to the East Coast. This is a slide showing one of those dust storms approaching the small town of Stratford, Texas in 1934. Here's another one showing the dust storm in Elkhart, Kansas in 1937. A few moments after this picture was taken, nothing would be seen, not even the sun would be seen through the dark dust. Dust also buried homes, farms, wagons. This picture is showing South Dakota in 1936. Without the, the grass and the trees, the ecosystem would be disrupted by the dust storms. Birds obviously would not stay in these areas because their natural food source would have been lost. Without birds 
the insect population, specifically spiders and centipedes, would grow to enormous sizes and be an additional danger to the people trying to survive. The hardest hit regions were, as I said, Kansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Colorado, and the people left and moved to the Pacific Coast. Dorothea Lange was sent out in the 1930s by the federal government to take photographs of the people trying to survive the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. Here is one of the pictures she took showing everything that was left of one family who was leaving for California trying to escape the dust storms. The only possession that they had left was their truck and in the back they would put all of their family members and any of their valuables. This is a map showing the enormous size of the Dust Bowl all the way from North Dakota south all the way to the area of Texas. As a result of the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, the 1930s saw Americans leaving their families and their children in order to drift looking for work, looking for hope. This term, the term used to describe these poor drifters is hobo. Hobos consisted of about 300,000 people who hitched rides around the country on trains or slept under bridges. Many of them were teenagers, in fact. Injuries and death were common on railroad property as railroads employed brutal men who rode the rails to attack hobos who would often ride hanging just inches above the tracks, or if they could, on top of the cars. This is a sign of how the economy not only has been crushed by the Great Depression, but also how the very basic elements of our society have broken down due to the effects of unregulated capitalism. With the collapse of capitalism in the United States, we now see the breakup of the American family. Other impacts of the collapse of capitalism in the United States saw a rise in depression as people lost hope in the face of losing everything. Suicides rose more than 30% between 1928 and 1932. Alcoholism rose very sharply in urban areas as people sought a way to numb themselves to the difficulties of economic collapse. Three times as many people were admitted to state mental hospitals as in normal times. This may be hard to understand, but people were entrusted with the property and savings that their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents had worked their entire lives to pass on to them, only to have it lost in the collapse of the American capitalist system. People didn't blame capitalism. People blamed themselves. In fact, they should have blamed capitalism they should have blamed the banks. They should have blamed the government. But instead, they blamed themselves. Despite this, many people showed great kindness to strangers. And many people came out of the Great Depression having developed habits of savings and thriftiness. Chapter 14, Section 3 describes how President Hubert Hoover struggled with the effects of the Great Depression. After the stock market crash, President Hoover tried to reassure many Americans. Going on radio, he said that any lack of confidence in the economic future of the United States is foolish, and he recommended business as usual. Herbert Hoover's political philosophy caused him to take a cautious approach to the Great Depression. As an economic conservative and traditional Republican, he believed that the government uh, 
should not be involved in the economy and that the free market was best left alone. Little did he know that it was the absence of government regulation in the economy that led to the Great Depression in the first place. Herbert Hoover believed that any handouts from the government, as he saw them, would weaken people's self-respect and moral fiber. His answer to needy people was that individual charities and local organizations should take care of them. The federal government should direct relief measures, but not through the federal bureaucracy. It would be too expensive, he felt, and would stifle individual liberties. Hubert Hoover believed in rugged individualism. Essentially, the idea that people should succeed through their own efforts. Look after yourself. This was ignorant of the problem facing the country, because while people had been looking out for themselves, they were utterly destroyed by the greed and speculation of the nation's banking system. Because they had entrusted the system with their life savings, when the system pursued its own greed, these rugged individuals were destroyed. Herbert Hoover's philosophy felt that people should take care of themselves and should not depend on the government when the banks were overly greedy and had needlessly destroyed the American economy. He responded to the American Great Depression by saying that people should pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, which is thinking that people could survive this on their own, when in fact all the evidence points to it that they could not. Hoover did, however, take some action. He successfully organized and then authorized the construction of the Boulder Dam, now called the Hoover Dam. With $700 million, the project was the world's tallest dam at 726 feet and the second largest dam in the world at 1,244 feet long. The dam currently provides electricity and flood control and water for seven western states. This is a picture of Hoover Dam, which is a short ride from Las Vegas, Nevada, and sits on the border of Arizona. Hoover's action came too little, too late. <clears throat> Hoover began to realize the overwhelming destruction of the American economy and tried to help with small measures. He created the Federal Farm Board to help farmers. He also created the National Credit Organization to help small banks. And he created the Federal Home Loan Banking Act and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to help protect people's homes and their businesses. However, in 1932, a very interesting event takes place, which remained main prominent in many people's minds when the election of 1932 came up. The spring saw 15,000 World War I veterans arrive in Washington, D.C. to support the Patman Bill. It was led, this group of veterans was led by Walter Waters, an unemployed cannery worker from Oregon. The Patman Bill was authorizing the government to pay a promised bonus to all World War I veterans who had not been adequately compensated for their wartime services. The bonus had been approved in 1924 and was supposed to be paid out in 1945 when many of these veterans would be dead. However, tough times saw the bonus army demand their bonus early. 
Congressman Wright Patman believed that these soldiers should be paid. Hoover thought that the bonus marchers were communists and persons with criminal records rather than real veterans. He opposed the legislation and he, res he respected their right to march peacefully. However, when the Patman bill died in the Senate from lack of support, Hoover then called on the marchers to leave. Here is a photograph showing thousands of Bonus Army soldiers protesting in the spring of 1932. Soon they would leave the steps of the United States Senate, as seen here in this picture, and they would set up a shanty town in the mall in front of the White House. When, the, when Hoover told the bonus marchers to go home, most of them did. However, 2,000 American veterans, heroes of World War I, refused to leave. Nervous that this angry group would become violent, President Hoover decided that they should be disbanded. On July 28th, he sent a thousand soldiers under the command of General Douglas MacArthur and his aide, Major Dwight D. Eisenhower, the future President of the United States, to disband them by force. A government official was watching nearby, and in your book on page 483, he recalls what happened next. He said, the 12th Infantry was in full battle dress. Each had a gas mask, and his belt was full of tear gas bombs. At orders, they brought their bayonets at thrust and moved in. The bayonets were used to jab people to make them move. Soon, almost everybody disappeared from view because tear gas bombs exploded. The entire block was covered by tear gas. Flames were coming up where soldiers had set fire to the buildings to drive these people out. Through the whole afternoon, they took one camp after another. MacArthur's 12th Infantry ultimately gassed more than a thousand of our American veterans, including one of their babies, an 11-month-old child who ultimately died. Two veterans were shot and many more were injured. At the sight of the American government attacking veterans of World War I, most Americans were outraged. And once again, Herbert Hoover's image suffered. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the future president of the United States, heard about the attack on the Bonus Army, he said to his friend, well, this will elect me. Ultimately, he is right, and he will run against Herbert Hoover and win because Herbert Hoover had little chance to be re-elected in 1932.